Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon to our friends uh, across the Atlantic uh, who are joining us for this conversation. Uh, welcome to EPI's webinar on worker misclassification, a global discussion of the issues. My name is Lynn Reinhardt. I'm a senior fellow here at the Economic Policy Institute, and I want to welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today for this discussion. Uh, EPI, in partnership with the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, whose Washington office director, Knut Pankman, is here today and will welcome you in just a minute, are delighted to have worked together on this project to bring attention to the issue of employer misclassification of workers as independent contractors and the implications of this misclassification for worker protections and worker rights. And we issued a report last week on this topic uh, in partnership with FES and are holding this webinar and a webinar last week on these issues. And we're delighted and so grateful to have such an expert panel uh, joining us today to discuss these issues. Uh, they will be introduced in a moment by our moderator for this discussion, Wilma Liebman, who is former chair of the National Labor Relations Board and a member of EPI's board of directors. Um, but before turning it over to, um, to the panel for this discussion, I want to turn it over to Knut Pankman of FES uh, with gratitude for FES's partnership on this project for Knut to say a few words and welcome people here today. So Knut, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Lynn, and also a warm welcome from me. Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, thank you for joining us for today's transatlantic debate. Uh, a special thank you to EPI's John Schmidt for his leadership, to Lynn Reinhardt for her expertise and the entire staff at EPI. It's always a great pleasure and honor to work with you and your wonderful team. Um, today's discussion, as Lynn said, is part two of a broader debate about employee status and follows a fantastic panel that Lynn moderated last week. Let me also warmly welcome our wonderful guests who are joining us remotely. And it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce my esteemed colleague and friend, Wilma Liebman, who will moderate today's event. President Barack Obama named Wilma Liebman as chairman of the National Labor Relations Board in 2009. She served in that role until 2011 and um, was the third longest serving member of the NLRB in its history having been first appointed by President Clinton. Since leaving the NLRB, Wilma has been engaged in various advisory roles and consulting projects. She has taught at several universities, including New York University, Rutgers University, and also Cornell University's Industrial and Labor Relations School. In March of 2020, Wilma was appointed as Chief External Ethics Officer for the United Automobile Workers Union, and she's also president of the Labor and Employment Relations Association, where US Labor Secretary Marty Walsh recently had the honor of being interviewed by her. So if you have not seen that interview, please look for it. Um, most relevant for today's discussion, I think, is Wilma and her expertise. She's one of the most distinguished labor policy experts in the US. And with that, I will hand it over to Wilma for today's discussion. Thank you so much for partnering with FES. Thank you both Lynn and Knut, and Knut, thank you for your very generous words. Uh, I am delighted to be here today to moderate today's discussion with experts from the European Union and the US Department of Labor. The issue of employee status and the problem of misclassification are of tremendous social and economic and political significance on both sides of the Atlantic. The ILO recently issued a comprehensive report on the topic. And as the report just issued by the EPI and FES explains, employer misclassification of workers as independent contractors is a longstanding and pervasive problem affecting millions of workers and costing the state billions of dollars each year. It affects a range of industries and workers from construction to port drivers, to taxi drivers and housekeeping, but it is rampant in low wage labor int intensive industries where women and people of color predominate. The question whether a worker is an employee or independent contractor determines whether the worker is covered by or excluded from the wide array of rights, protections and benefits of workplace law, including minimum wage, an overtime anti-discrimination protection, 
safety and health laws, workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, the right to organize and bargain collectively. In the US, the legal determination is binary. In some European countries, including the UK, there is also an intermediate category. The question of employee status has always been complicated. And to give some historical context, in 1944, in a case involving Hearst publications and so-called newsboys, the US Supreme Court said that few problems in the law have given greater variety of application and conflict in results than the cases arising in the borderland between what is clearly, clearly an employer-employee relationship and what is clearly one of independent entrepreneurial dealing. The issue is complicated by ongoing disputes under an array of federal, state, and even local legislation over the definition of employment itself and misclass misclassification of employees as self-employed contractors. New technology enabled business models and modes of engaging workers, especially the Uber phenomenon and the explosion of the gig economy through digital platforms has further aggravated the longstanding dilemmas, brought them into the public eye and preoccupied judges and policymakers, advocates and scholars for several years now in the US and in Europe. In the US, last year's California Proposition 22 uh, financed by Uber and its platform allies made these disputes all the more urgent. Proposition 22 nullif nullified for app-based drivers California's recently enacted Assembly Bill 5, which expanded the definition of employee for state wage and hour law by adopting the so-called ABC test. Post Proposition 22, these app-based drivers are now effectively entrenched as independent contractors for California state law purposes. Uber and other platforms can be expected to lobby Congress for a federal bill analogous to Proposition 22. On the other hand, organized labor is heavily invested in enactment of the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, a comprehensive labor law reform bill, which would, among other things, expand the narrow common law definition of employee applied under the National Labor Relations Act to the more expansive ABC test. While the House of Representatives passed the, the PRO Act, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, Senate passage of this, of this bill faces long odds. Most likely, both sides in the deeply divided Congress can and will stop federal legislation that is either favored or opposed by organized labor. In the European Union, other and different initiatives are underway or under consideration. Our three panelists today will be discussing these issues of employee status and misclassification, how they impact workers, and how they are being approached in the US and by the European Union and its different member states. So enough from me, I just wanted to give a little background. Uh, let me introduce briefly our three wonderful speakers. Um, we'll hear first from Maria Jepson, who is Deputy Director of Eurofound, the European Foundation for the Improvement of Living and Working Conditions, which is the tripartite EU agency providing knowledge to assist in the development of better social employment and work-related policies. She has served in this role since late 2019. Prior to this, she was director of the research department at the European Trade Union Institute. She is currently also associate professor in labor economics at the Free University of Brussels. Her main research interests include gender studies and the impact of welfare states on labor supply, wages and working conditions. She holds a PhD in economics from the Free University of Brussels. Uh, second, we'll hear from Stefan Olsen, who is Director for Employment with the Directorate General Employment of the European Commission. This commission department is responsible for EU policy on employment, social affairs, skills, and labor mobility. Stefan is a Swedish lawyer with degrees in international EU and tax law. He joined the European Commission in 1996, dealing with gender equality, fundamental rights issues, as well as social dialogue. In 2015, he took up the position of director in the Directorate General Employment 
with responsibility, among other things, for legislative and policy issues relating to working conditions. And third, here in the US, our speaker will be Jessica Lumen, who was appointed to be Deputy Wage and Hour Administrator at the US Department of Labor on January 20, 2021. Congratulations, Jessica. Uh, the Wage and Hour Division enforces worker protections and provides outreach and education about federal labor laws, including minimum wage, overtime, child labor, and family and medical leave for nearly 10 million employers nationwide. Before joining the Wage and Hour Division, Jessica served as the Executive Director of the Minnesota State Building and Construction Trades Council, where among other responsibilities, she protected the physical and financial health of union construction workers. Jessica is a graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School. So welcome to our three very distinguished panelists. Um, so let's begin. My first question, and I'm, that for the audience, uh, our discussion is going to be generally organized around four questions I've come up with, uh, but I'll be monitoring the chat for other questions that the audience may pose. So first, let me ask each of you, starting with Maria, um, misclassification of workers as independent contractors instead of employees, as I said, is a long stand standing problem and quite serious. At least in the US, it's a problem for the affected workers, but also for the state which loses significant tax revenue. Can you describe and talk about the problem as it exists uh, in your respective jurisdictions from the perspective of the affected workers and the state? So let's begin with Maria, please. Hey, thank you very much. And thank you very much for inviting me to, to this event. Uh, I read the report with great interest and uh, we are currently conducting research that is somewhat very similar to, to the same kind of, asking the same kind of questions. So what we've been looking at is basically to say, uh, misclassification is a, is a, is a long-standing uh, issue. And what we've been trying to do is, is kind of identify what is the extent of the problem, right? Because what we usually see is we see the extent of the problem when it comes to court, but what we wanted to do is to, what is the potential extent of the problem and what are the different uh, problems or challenges associated with workers that could find themselves in uh, what we would call more in European language, bogus self-employed, okay? It's bogus self-employment, which would be the misclassification. So the, 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 the rate of self-employed in Europe is fairly stable, okay? It's, it's hoovering around 14%. It's not, you know, it's not vastly decreasing, not vastly increasing. And what we wanted to do is to, out of this group of self-employed is to identify exactly the group that, were, that are facing this challenge of misclassification. And we've been using criteria, different criteria in different studies, but basically uh, by and large, uh, uh, using survey data, looking at issues like dominance of a single client, lack of influence on, on the price, influence, uh, a lack of influence on, on working hours, and lack of influence on content and order of tasks. So really looking at what part of the self-employed can be categorized into what do not uh, meet these four these or meet these four criteria, and what we can see is like sixty-two percent do actually have a more uh, do not have a dominant supply, have an influence on the price, have an influence on their working hours, and influence on contents and and order of tasks, and we would say they these self-employed are not a part of what we would call potential misclassified, but the other 38% are. And when we go into the other 38% and we try to unearth, is there an accumulation of factors that could, uh, that could make them potentially misclassified? We see a little bit of a messy picture. You know, we don't get a clear and nice answer back on this one. But what we do see is that we only have 0.1% 14% that have four out of four not met. So that category is very low, but we have at least 38 with at least one. And those are the ones we want to go, go in and understand more what's happening. And, and within this, this ca category, we see that economic dependence does not always go together with organizational dependency. So there are two factors where one needs to look at and not only in, in a cumulative uh, manner. So the economic dependency on, on one client and the organizational dependency, meaning that the organization basically sets all the rules. You can dissociate them, you can um, also accumulate them. What we see when we look at all these criteria is, is that certain groups come out as being more predominant. That would be women, young people, blue collar workers, 
self-employment and self-employed in transport in other in other studies uh, it's also construction that comes out it's education that comes out and we also see that uh, this, these categories are more prevalent in countries with weak labor law okay so in the countries with with an encompassing labor law system or in, in with strong social partners you would see less of these phenomena so it is it, so you can see it, it's prevalent in certain well, sectors, categories of workers, and more prevalent in, in certain uh, countries. And of course, then the impact on the workers will be different as well. In certain countries, uh, despite the fact of being bogus self-employed, there will be some kind of basic social protection attached because it's, uh, it's universal. And in other countries, not at all. But I think what one can say is that there's a real issue with regard to health and safety. There's, there's a real issue uh, occupational health and safety. There's a real issue with regard to uh, paid holidays, with regard to sick pay, where workers are not uh, included. Uh, unemployment benefits, proper pension contributions. In countries where they actually open up to self-employed, many self-employed don't join, either because they don't know they can join or because they financially can't afford it. And that means when we look at the state level then, is that there's a loss of, 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 of earnings, of course, because no ta ta taxes are not paid, uh, social contributions are not paid, and so the social protection system kind of loses out on these earnings. Um, so so it, it can be seen as for a certain group of workers or self-employed as, as a lose-lose situation, but one has to be very careful to distinguish within the group of self-employed that there are what we would call genuine self-employed, and we be, need to be very careful about how and really identify those that are potentially misclassified and not only identify them once they go into court to try to be reclassified. Thank you very much. That was extremely uh, helpful. And I think you put the issues in sharp focus. Uh, let's turn to Stefan now. Thank you. Thank you, Wilma. And, and uh, well, here it's afternoon. So, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Um, Maria and I, of course, have the same scope uh, in terms of geographical scope that we work on. So, so uh, I'm I'm very happy to to complement uh, her her very clear intervention, um, and then we'll come back. I think to policy measures, but but I think those those come a bit later. So, uh, what? Just to start off, uh, what's important in this complex legal system that we have in the EU, uh, it is to see that we have the shared competence in this area. So, so the EU system uh, will cover some, uh, some uh, rights, uh, let's say working time, uh, with, the, with the maximum working time uh, uh, limit, uh, or um, exposure to a certain chemical. Uh, in the workplace. Uh, these these uh, legal acts uh, called directives, they, they don't define the worker as such. They, they send the, the uh, definition back to the member state. So the competence uh, to, to define a worker can be by social partners in the country I, I, I come from, Sweden, uh, can be by legislation uh, in another country. Uh, but that's done at national level, and this, this, uh, but there is a obviously uh, then a, a certain tension or 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 a, uh, an interaction between the two levels because then when you have an issue about working time, and the question does a person fall under the directive or not, uh, in a case where a member states would have a system where the court has felt that uh, the the European Court of Justice in the end has felt that the, the way the member states has defined uh, the worker or the self-employed uh, is you know, too far away from the purposes of the directive and has therefore, in some cases, uh, gone back and said, no, the member state might define uh, this as a self-employed, but actually for the purposes of this directive, it's a worker and we apply the directive. Um, and, and, and this now, when we're getting into this, this new, uh, newer economy, and, and for the EU, this is rather new, uh, mostly driven by the platform economy, where, where this is uh, escalating and, and speeding up this issue of, 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 of self-employment, this is now becoming a, a real issue. 
uh, and we're seeing increasing court cases on the platforms um, and uh, where, where we, we see that the, the courts are uh, taking decisions, often classifying vulnerable self-employed as workers. And, and, and uh, so this is, this is the legal situation right now, and it puts us, uh, policymakers, or at least taking the initiatives in the executive um, in this situation, which I'll come back to later on, uh, with a lot of pressure and a lot of demand from member states and, and the European Parliament, etc., to take another step and go in and, and, and set up, uh, at least relating to the platform uh, economy, a more clear definition. And also my colleagues in DG Competition who are dealing with the issue that you mentioned, Vilma, on the, on the right to collective bargaining, that's also coming up. So we are at a very exciting moment right now, uh, but I, I maybe come back to that when, when we talk about the policy options. Thanks. Yeah, uh, thank you. What, what you said reminds me of something I've said for a number of years, whether you like Uber or hate Uber, it has brought these issues to the forefront. Uh, yeah. And these issues which have existed for decades and problems that have existed, but now they're finally getting attention. So Jessica, let's turn to you, please. Great, thank you. Um, again, thanks so much for having me uh, participate in this in this conversation. It's, it's really helpful to hear from some of our transatlantic friends um, how they're thinking about these issues and the fact that this isn't isolated to the United States and, and some of the ways that we're trying to help protect workers. And particularly, as Wilma said, some of the lowest wage, most vulnerable workers are really part of the focus of the wage and hour division. Uh, just for background, um, because I, we, I am with the U.S. Department of Labor, we, the wage and hour division is the regulatory body that uh, actually enforces the law in the United States, um, minimum wage, overtime, child labor, as, as Wilma said. And so we look at this misclassification of worker uh, issue very much in the space of uh, we have the employment and the employer employee relationship in the United States is paramount to the effective administration of our entire economy. Um, that's how our economy was built. And that's how so many of our uh, workplace protections and and frankly, social safety nets are based on that employer-employee relationship in our country. And so we really think about ourselves as a worker protection agency. Um, and we look at the work that we do in sort of three buckets. Um, and this is in it, in how it relates to misclassification of workers is we have to make sure all three buckets are, um, are filled in order to make sure that we're effectuating the purposes of the laws that we enforce. And the first that we work on is prevention. Right? We want to avoid any wage and hour violations in the first place. We want to avoid, we want to make sure that everybody understands their rights and responsibilities under the law, and uh, we do that through outreach and education. Then we take a lot of work on compliance, and this is where we provide technical assistance to employers, particularly to make sure that they um, understand what their their law responsibilities are. But not only that, but we try to do early detection and correction of potential violations so that they aren't they don't become pervasive. And then finally, of course, we do enforcement and we do uh, about 25,000 enforcement cases every year uh, around the country to make sure that we're fully and fairly enforcing the law. Now, where that comes in when we're talking about misclassification of workers as independent contractors is that it's in every single one of those areas that we really have to focus. Because um, when we, when, to answer one last question, when we look at workers and the impact that this has on workers, one, they don't necessarily understand or know their rights uh, and so that's our outreach component. We have to make sure that they know what their rights are in the first place. Secondly, uh, we have we do see error. We do sometimes, see, you know, we we call it misclassification here, which sort of implies a bookkeeping error in so many ways. I am actually going to adopt Maria. I think what you called it was bogus self-employed. Um, I am going to adopt that phrase. Thank you. Uh, I learned uh, something already this morning, which I knew I would. Um, and so, you know, sometimes there are there are bookkeeping errors around how workers are classified. Uh, and so we try to correct those in the compliance space. But really, the enforcement areas um, is how we can really help workers. And we, we look at workers on a case by case basis to determine whether or not their relationship with their employer uh, is or their, the person who has hired them. Right. Whether or not that does uh, meet the employee employer relationship and therefore they get the protections of our laws. Um, absent that, they don't. I mean, that's the black and white that uh, Wilma was saying is we have a binary uh, classification here is either that you're an employee and get protections or you're self-employed um, business owner 
of your own uh, and you don't have the protections of the minimum wage, overtime, child labor and family medical leave act, let alone unemployment, workers' compensation, um, uh, social security, all of the other components of things that we have uh, that really are designed to help uh, workers. So we we look at this um, in from the perspective of the worker. We look at we're worker focused analysis, and so we try to do the the, the framework. And, and to Maria's point, we currently are using a multi factor totality of the circumstances uh, seven factor test uh, to determine uh, whether or not an individual worker is in relationship with their individual um, hiring partner uh, as an employee or as a something else as an independent contractor. Uh, are happy to talk about our seven factor test. It's not magic. It's a lot of the same things that you talked about, Maria. It's a, it's a lot of the same things that we, that we look at in different relationships and that NLRB looks at lots of different things, but we, we use seven factors. Um, so that's how we look at it from the worker perspective. I think the other question is the state and, and Wilma talked about this in her opening is that the impact of misclassification of workers as independent contractors um, is huge. The we estimate between state and federal studies, between 10 and 30 percent of employers, those 10 million employers that Wilma talked about, uh, misclassify at least one worker. Uh, we have 148 million workers in our country that we're trying to protect with our uh, Fair Labor Standards Act and other uh, worker protection laws. And so the impact to the state is that they don't get the tax revenue that is otherwise uh, received because of that employer-employee relationship as the basis for our economy. Uh, we don't have the contributions into our uh, unemployment system. We don't have our contributions into the IRS, into the tax system, uh, under the income tax uh, withholding. We don't have contributions into all of the other state run social safety nets uh, that we really rely on as a country. And so to Wilma's point, it is. It is a huge impact on workers, and it is also a huge impact on the, the economies, the communities, uh, and, and, and the administration of the laws of both the states and the federal government. So a really important issue. Really glad we're having this conversation today and looking forward to more. So thanks. Thank you, Jessica. I'm just wondering whether going to Maria's point <laughs> that uh, their research indicates that uh, misclassification or bogus self-employment is kind of a stable problem. Uh, do you have a sense in the U.S. whether the numbers are stable or whether the incidence has increased? So it's a great question. Um, it, it's hard to know because we don't have, you know, obviously under the EPI study, we're, we're learning more. Um, but we get the sense that it's an incre that it's increasing because it's a business model choice, right? That if you in in the U.S., if you misclassify an employee as an independent contractor, you you g gain a competitive advantage. And since every, because you don't have all of the costs that are associated with being an employer. Um, and so the more the business model is successful it perpetuate of misclassification, it continues to perpetuate itself. And so we are seeing more and more uh, businesses use this model um, in order to reduce their costs, gain a competitive advantage and pre prevent workers from having the worker protections. I think you're mute now. Thank you. So uh, let's go to my second question then for all three of you. Uh, as to what strategies are in place for addressing the misclassification problem? What kind of enforcement mechanisms exist? Are they effective? Are new strategies envisioned now with uh, a Biden administration or uh, within the European Union itself? So I'll start with Maria again, if I might. OK, thank you very much, Wilma. Um, I mean, European Union is 27 countries, um, so I'm not going to take up the whole time talk, but I just say that in, in the European Union, there's a lot of different strategies. I mean, the member states have not taken the, the, the same approach. I'll let Stefan talk about the European level, but on, on the on, on member state level, there's not been the same approach. As you said before, there's this there's this, been this establishment of a hybrid kind of third status between being an employee and a self-employed. But Austria and Italy have taken that route. Uh, in, in others, uh, they have more gone towards the route of, of defining what is economic dependent uh, status. So it's also kind of a, this third status, but it's called economically dependent status. Portugal, Slovakia and Spain has gone down that route. And basically they just say, if more than 80 or 75% of your income comes from one client, 
then you are perceived as being economic dependent and then you get social protection rights. So th there's kind of a give and a take that there is some, the, some kind of issue. Then we go to another set of countries that have not gone down this third status route, but has more done what I think the US has done is improving their criteria for establishing who's who. And uh, you got the criteria of economic dependent um, in Germany, Latvia and Malta, and a more other criteria to clearly distinguish employment from self-employment would be in Ireland, in Belgium. In Belgium, they're really strong on being dependent, having autonomy in terms of how you work. So it's kind of not the economic dependency, but it's the organizational dependency. And that's what I made the point, you know, we've got these two factors and they don't necessarily play together. So there's a lot of different strategies. Um, and What's the most successful? I think that for, for me, I don't have that assessment here. I don't have the evaluation of what's the, more, the best route to take. I think all countries, you know, they've got different institutions. The institutions come together different. They've got different kind of, 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 of traditions, different ways of doing. But I think what all comes together here, it will only be as successful as the enforcement is. And I think that's what most countries are actually struggling with is to have enough labor inspectors to actually enforce this, uh, the, 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 these ideas, these, these the ways of going around it. So I think that's a very important, and that was also put on the table that enforcement is something that needs to be, uh, you know, you need to have enough of the labor inspectorates to actually to go out and check on this and, and to figure out what, what, what's going on. And then we need, a, 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 so I think what has been really been uh, going through in, in, in the EU is that the court has been mopping up a, a lot of this. So it's maybe less the labor inspectorate and, and uh, you know, like employers uh, playing in, but it's very much the court court rulings that have been in and, and, and trying to um, figure, figure out what, what the misclassification is all about. But here again, we know that that's completely underreported because most of the, the misclassified workers are those that will be low skilled. It's a costly and long process. They will often be, uh, you know, be in a very fragile situation where that will endanger their, uh, their economic uh, viability and so forth. And so you could say that having representatives, uh, so we haven't spoken about that, you know, having worker representatives like trade unions to be able to present uh, like more vulnerable groups of self-employed could actually help them to, to, to get their rights and be, I mean, reclassified out of the legal system. So that, that would be a point I think that could go also to, on the table is that the court is doing a lot of the work, but there might be a way out uh, of the court is by having collective representative uh, representing of, of self-employed, vulnerable self-employed that can ensure that they are reclassified. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. That was really very helpful. You know, Canada also has a dependent contractor classification. Uh, those workers have collective bargaining rights, but the subject of an intermediate category became quite contested here uh, after all the litigation with Uber began. So, Stefan, let's uh, turn to you, if I may. Thanks a lot. And, and uh, it was very interesting also to listen to, to Jessica and, and to hear that it's basically the same, no? the, the binary and the, the effects uh, on, on the worker and on the economy. Uh, so that's very similar uh, between the US and the EU. Um, when we look at the policy measures, um, I'll, I'll refer to, to three of them. Um, a few years ago, we presented a, a proposal for uh, an update of an old legislation we had uh, on uh, the um, information to workers uh, about their contracts uh, at the start of the employment relationship uh, called the written, it was the written statement directive. Uh, I think it was from 91. Uh, and we, we, it was definitely time to update that one, uh, which we did. Uh, and we proposed what was called the Transparent and Predictable Working Conditions Directive, which uh, contained two elements. One was a, a stricter, uh, a stricter, clearer provision for who should get uh, the, the, uh, some kind of information, digital or written, at the start of the contract, which, which links to Maria's point about labor inspection because uh, of course uh, having that type of paper uh, would uh, or or app uh, would uh, would of course simplify uh, inspection and, and clarify what, what conditions you actually have because this as we all know can be an issue a uh, young person doesn't really understand the difference between uh, being self-employed or employed 
And then there was a second material rights part of this proposal, which was about, you know, basically taking out the possibility of zero hour contracts, which is, which is a very closely linked issue to this. Um, and that proposal also contained a kind of half, halfway uh, attempt from uh, our side, from the EU side, to go towards an EU definition of worker. Uh, but that was quite firmly rejected by the member states. Uh, feeling that that would uh, that would uh, infringe, so to say, the the this this shared competence. Uh, also, because the social partners in some countries do this, uh, and and that would be very sensitive to let the EU courts into that process. But that was it was adopted this directive in in very good time, and I think it was a first very important step. Uh, so it it basically con it it it. For all workers, uh, clearer, faster uh, information and 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 uh, about their rights at the start of the contract, and then some provisions about the very vulnerable short-term uh, assignments that there needs to be more clarity, more you can't call somebody in at an hour's notice, and if they don't come, fire them. Uh, but as long as you're a worker, uh, so we 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 stayed there. Um, then what we had, so that, that, was, that was adopted at the end of, of the last uh, uh, legislature. Uh, and now under this commission, our, uh, our incoming president uh, announced early on that she wanted to improve uh, the uh, conditions for platform workers. So uh, that, that became then our, uh, our work path. Um, and, and here, obviously, we came very fast to the conclusion that the issue of the self-employment status of, we think, around 90% no, of, 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 uh, of the platform workers would be self-employed. Um, and, uh, and, and here, uh, in this process, we have, uh, we have a number of steps we have to go through under this legal basis. And one is that we consult uh, uh, social partners. So business, uh, business and uh, workers organizations in a two-stage process. And that is now going on. And last week uh, we issued the second stage consultation document. Uh, and I can provide you with the link of that afterwards if, if maybe to circulate to the participants because it's, I find it a, a very good, a very good, clear written document with different, with defining the problem and defining different options. Um, and and uh, just to briefly refer to those options, uh, which we then, unless the social partners at EU level would decide to negotiate an agreement, which could become a law, we would then put forward on on some of these options or all of the options we would put forward a legal proposal. And, and this basically is, is, is not an EU definition of worker of platform worker again, uh, that, that, that we have uh, taken out of the equation because everybody has said we don't want it, uh, but it is then more procedural issues. Either, either uh, some, uh, an irrebuttable uh, presumption, thus saying that platform workers um, with certain, uh, with uh, so under certain criteria, uh, quite you know solidly defined, uh, would automatically become uh, workers unless the platform could show that this is not the case. Um, uh, and and then we have a slightly softer version which turns the issue around. So that would be a shift of the burden of proof, something we've used a lot, for example, in equality. Uh, law, where if the worker can show uh, a, num uh, a certain dependency, or then uh, he has uh, or she established a, a prima facie case, and the platform would need to show uh, that this is actually a self-employed, and then we we have a number of op other options. But I think those are the 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 more central options that we would be taking forward uh, uh, and i don't think the the social partners are are that keen to negotiate that's what they signal today so that would mean by the end of this year a legal proposal uh, in this in one of these directions then we would combine that with some uh, registration some transparency conditions we would also look at ai but that's not the discussion today so I'll, i don't go into that um, and then in parallel, our uh, uh, 
um, uh, close colleagues dealing with competition law are taking forward a complementary um, initiative because as, as, as you're aware, uh, in the, under competition law, a uh, bit everywhere in the world, but in the EU particularly, uh, if you are an undertaking, you cannot conclude a, 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 an agreement because it would become a cartel. Um, and, and that uh, our top politicians have seen, of course, as a, a, a quite big danger, because if you would have a trade union or, or a group of, of, of platform people active in platforms, uh, concluding an agreement, and then it would be stopped because it would be seen as a cartel, it would be a, a political and a social disaster. So our, our friends in DG Competition are looking at ways to uh, issue guidance. Uh, I think this is the most uh, probable option to make clear that uh, the, the, the vulnerable self-employed, thus not the uh, dentist to simplify uh, the situation, but rather the Uber, Uber um, uh, rider, uh, would be able to enter in such an agreement uh, collectively with the platform, and that would not be classified as a cartel. So, And that's also for the end of this year. So we are at a very dynamic and interesting period here, but I'll, I'll stop now for, for the moment. Thanks when you've um, kind of give us a clue to what's coming yeah. further in our discussion. Um, but let me uh, turn to Jessica. Me, uh, turn... Let me turn to Jessica uh, to, uh, to address this question of strategies in play and enforcement mechanisms and how effective are they? Well, thanks. Um, and again, learning lots this morning, so thank you. Um, I think the sort of, I'm going to flip it uh, on the opposite way of how Maria did it and talk about enforcement first and then sort of talk about what's happening in the states. But um, enforcement first at the federal level. Uh, the federal law does not currently make misclassification of a worker's independent contractor a violation of the law. Uh, so in order to enforce misclassification, we have to generally find an underlying violation. So a worker has to have not received minimum wage, uh, which the federal minimum wage in the United States right now, as you know, is $7.25 an hour, um, or has had not to have received overtime, which is time and a half after 40, or some other uh, violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act or another law that we enforce uh, before we could also identify um, misclassification of a worker as an independent contractor. Uh, and so that's a huge challenge for us, as you can imagine, and I think something that you all have dealt with as well. And so one of the things that we are looking at is we're looking at how do we make our enforcement better generally so that we can also identify and address misclassification. And our strategies are, um, they're, they're, they're tried and true. They're, they're nothing that uh, you haven't heard of or isn't happening all over the world. Uh, we are doing outreach, as I talked about. We have a new campaign uh, called uh, Essential Workers for Essential Protections, and that's as our workers are emerging from COVID, we are uh, making sure that we're getting out and talking to uh, workers, their advocates, their trusted partners, community-based organizations, so that they understand what their rights are. And so far since April, since we launched that, we have reached over 22,000 participants. Um, and we particularly focus on how to make a complaint with us, how to reach us, how to make sure that um, folks know that their government is here working for them. Uh, and so that's been really rewarding in terms of making sure people know where we are. Um, but we don't just, we're not just complaint based at the federal government. We do a, a mix of both complaint based work where workers come to us and they need our help uh, enforcing their law, the laws, but we also do what we call directed inv investigations where we identify based on data-driven information, industries and uh, workplaces where we will go and identify workers who may uh, be uh, victims of violations related to the wage and hour laws in, in the federal government. Um, and so we do about 50% of our work in that space and we specifically identify low wage and vulnerable workers. And to Stephen's uh, point, Stephen's point to make sure that we um, are identifying uh, areas where workers may be more likely to be exploited in this this uh, in in this misclassification space. So we do directed um, in enforcement. We also are doing strategic partnerships with other with we have uh, memorandums of understanding to help us enforce the law with states, with local governments, with um, uh, other federal agencies to make sure that we're not working silos when we're doing our enforcement and that we're, we're communicating across 
uh, governmental lines to help provide the most protections for workers. Um, and then I think finally, and this is a, probably a universal issue, is that we need we we need more resources, and we're receiving more resources, and so we're actually hiring more investigators so we can have more boots on the ground, so that we can make sure that we're identifying uh, violations and enforcing the law um, everywhere we possibly can be. There will never be enough resources, as you all know, uh, but we are trying to get more resources and trying to get more uh, enforcement. So those are sort of our tried and true strategies, but again, we're trying to be more focused, we're trying to be more data-driven, and we're trying to impact workers who need us the most uh, and get to them and find them where they are. Um, I think on the state-by-state -state analysis, and, and Wilma gave us a good preview of this as well, um, we are doing, uh, we are seeing uh, the California uh, example that Wilma gave us around what's called the ABC test, uh, which does, as Stefan says, ha have a presumption of employee status uh, unless you can uh, demonstrate that there is a, um, a, a true self-employed person running their own business. Um, that uh, model has been used in different forms uh, in different places across the country. Uh, we see a, a form of that in Massachusetts. We see um, a form of that um, in several other states. Um, and then the president has actually uh, proposed in his budget for this year uh, that he work, we, we work with Congress uh, to develop a federal ABC analysis uh, so that we can protect more workers and actually create a misclassification of workers as independent contractors standalone um, violation and analysis. So that's something we're pretty excited about. I just want to give one quick example from Minnesota because uh, I, it, uh, which is where I came from, and I was with the Department of Labor and Industry and the Departments of Commerce there before I came to the federal government. And in Minnesota, we have a misclassification of workers uh, as independent contractors law, specifically for the construction industry, where we know that there are a lot of uh, violations, uh, exploitation, seasonal, temporary, transient work workers. Um, and so uh, some lessons learned from that, and I just put the, plant this seed, is we also did uh, early in our misclassification work, we did a registration program where we registered workers um, as independent contractors, and that really backfired on us uh, from a um, administrative, operational, and frankly, the goals that we were trying, the outcomes we were trying to achieve, which was protecting more workers. What ended up happening is more workers uh, created their, uh, were either voluntarily or um, at the insistence of their hiring contractor created an, uh, their own business entity, uh, which they registered that own business entity as an independent contractor, even though they weren't operating as an independent contractor. And it really undermined the purpose of the registration program. So I just flag that for folks is if you're thinking about how to how, how to keep track of independent contractors, registration uh, can be a challenge. Um, but what we did do in Minnesota uh, and has been effective in Minnesota is uh, we changed that registration model to a um, a, a pure uh, sign up, right? right? There's no criteria to be identified as an independent contractor uh, to a pure, um, you, either you're in the registry or you're not. And then uh, presumption is that if you are not in the registry, you are an employee. And even if you are in the registry, uh, that flips that presumption, right? So um, I think that there's some really interesting models happening. It's been it's been helpful in effectuating the purposes of the law, which was to protect more workers, more construction workers, and make sure that they were treated as employees in Minnesota. Um, there are a lot of lessons learned from that program. Happy to talk about that. And then also to Stefan's point, one of the other things that we did in Minnesota is um, more recently is we passed a very strong wage theft law. Uh, that included some of the protections that you're talking about, about notice to employees of who their employer is, how to contact their employer. When workers don't know who they're working for, it's a pretty good indication uh, that there is some other type of vulnerability or exploitation happening. Um, they don't know when they're supposed to get paid. They don't know who's supposed to pay them. And they don't know, um, they don't have a written contract, so they're not running their own business. Uh, so those kinds of wage theft laws that we're seeing passed across the country can also really help address misclassification of workers uh, because then they actually have understand what their relationship is to the person who's hiring them. So lots of exciting things happening, but I don't think we're quite as far along as you guys are um, in some of these uh, directives and things like that. So happy to learn more about that. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. You actually just uh, stole the point I was going to make, which is listening to Jessica, uh, our friends on the other side of the Atlantic probably have a sense that much more innovation 
uh, and pro-worker uh, legislation and initiatives is happening at the state level, at least in some of the states, not all the states. Um, I have a sense that uh, whatever disputes you may have at the European Union level, you probably have a greater chance of doing something at that level than we do at the Congress uh, at the federal level right now. Um, but let me then turn to something that you've all touched on so far, which is the platform economy gig work. Uh, and, and can you talk about how significant a misclassification problem is posed by this app-based work? Uh, is it growing in significance? Uh, are there separate strategies in place? Stefan's turn to, uh, touched on this a bit. Um, to address this misclassification issues for app-based workers. Um, there have been countless uh, lawsuits brought in the US and Europe contesting the, the classification of various platform workers uh, as, as uh, independent contractors. There have been mixed outcomes. Some of these cases are still unresolved. And so could I ask uh, each of you to give us a, an overview of what's the state of the law. And um, maybe for this one, I should start with you, Stefan, and then go to Maria and Jessica. Hey, thanks very much. Well, if, if, you, if, if your question is, is about the, the extent, uh, then possibly Maria is better placed, I think. I'm trying to read Maria's face there, but I don't want to put you in a difficult position. We're, we're looking into this, but we're working closely with you. I'll, I'll give Maria, I'd, I'd hand over to Maria and, and see what she says first, because on figures, I'm always worried about trying to, to uh, out uh, to, to be before you're found. So please. Okay, I'll try to give it a stab. I'm gonna, on, on the extent, um, I'll cite, the, the Commission's Joint Research Center on this one, because we don't count the head, we have, don't have to do head counts on platform workers. I, I think the GRC came out with a, an estimation about, I think it was 11%, uh, 14, yeah, 11%, I think, um, I got it right around here, so any uh, of, of, of people in, well, uh, of, of the, the workforce actually engages with the platform work to, to one extent and the other, but a very low percent, like 1.5% actually make a livelihood out of it, okay? So it's, 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 it's not, and I think like, you know, 10, 11% is not marginal phenomena, it's a real phenomena, but when it's really up to livelihood, it is a margin, it's still a marginal phenomena. Now, I think what we've seen over the last one and a half years with the way that we all work remotely, that this could change. You know, what we're seeing in the platform economy, what we call platform economy today, could spill over into what we call the real economy. So, and that's why it's important that we actually deal with these issues today. But apart from that, so what's going on? Well, as, as, as you said, we're a lot of court cases, but I think what's really, when we talk about platform work, we've done uh, a classification or categorization of platform work. And you know, like self-employment, platform work is so diverse, okay? Yeah, it's very difficult to take all platform workers and just put them under the same because you got platform workers where it's basically just mediation. You got a real self-employed relationship running from the client through some kind of platform and then having the self-employed. And then you got all the way down to the click workers and to the, the food delivery riders and so forth. So it's an extremely diverse group. So in the court cases, what we've seen in Europe, and well, I think more than a hundred of them have been more or less analyzed. Most of the court cases are on location, low skilled work it's it, no it's it's uh, it's drivers and it's uh, food delivery services these these are the workers where the court cases have been driven so it's much less the online platform work which is also i mean pretty precarious in some circumstances and not at all in other circumstances but we're not seeing these come into the court it's really on location most of it drivers and, and riders some of them also domestic work okay and and, and mini tasks so and as you said, you know, they've been, this is taking place in various courts across the member states, uh, and they all have different ways of ruling according to the national context, the individual cases and so forth. But lately, there's more of a harmonization in terms of outcomes of these court cases. And it is to reclassify these on location riders and drivers to employees, mostly. Okay, so I would say before there was less of a, of, of a homogeneous, you would get court cases where in one instance it would be employed, then it would be reversed to self-employed and so forth. 
but most that is coming out this it seems to there is a, a, a consensus that it, that it is more employees and one of the main reasons a lot of reasons why 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 the judgments are being brought up because it's a national context but one of them is clearly with regard to the organization of the work which is not autonomous okay so it has to do with subordination it has to do with the branding you know that you do not create your own brand you are told how to dress, how to act, uh, you, you, you are assessed on it. And so all these phenomena play in and make that uh, the, 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 most of the courts are classifying on these very specific platform, platform work, uh, classifying them to employees. With regard to legislation, uh, Spain has just come out with a very interesting piece of legislation on yeah, like, like 12th of May. And I think it's the first piece of legislation in Europe that actually goes out and says that couriers, so riders who deliver drivers, riders, are employees. And it's the only piece of legislation, but it's, it's one kind of platform, it's one kind of work within the platform, so it's kind of narrow, but one can say it's a test case to maybe, you know, um, advance with, with regard to other kind of platform work. Um, but the other legislations that have come out is more like Germany is playing around with the, with the, the proof of birth, uh, you know, and saying that might be a way of, of, of playing it out. Uh, most countries have, have categorized uh, the, the, the riders uh, as in this third hybrid status. But what a lot of the countries have done in legislation is actually give the riders the right to be collectively represented. And I think that's an interesting phenomenon. So giving voice to this category of workers. But so it's, uh, as, as, as Stefan said, it's, it's a very dynamic period, it's an interesting period, uh, and, but things are being done very, very differently across the European, uh, across the member states. Thank you very much for that overview. Um, and Stefan, do you want to weigh in now? <laughs> sure, uh, thanks, and, and uh, very briefly, no, I, I, the, the, we see that, that, that the platform work uh, is is increasing uh, rapidly, um, and uh, and the the value of the platform work is is increasing rapidly, and uh, we see that that the salary uh, the the combined salaries do not increase as rapidly. For example, huh? so 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 I think we we can see a precariousness um, and 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 that that is growing. Uh, but as, as Maria has said, we, we, our, our statistics, our figures haven't caught up really yet. So, and this will be a bit the challenge that uh, we're faced with when we have to do a rather extensive impact assessment for this proposal I, I mentioned coming up. Um, so, so we're doing a number of studies on that. But uh, clearly, uh, what, what if, I, if I go back to the politics, what we see in statements and, and in these developments that, that Maria has been describing, we see that finance ministries are getting more and more worried uh, in the sense of, as, as, as Jessica described as well, I mean, the tax revenues are going down with uh, countries, uh, some of the member states or all member states have advanced social systems or social welfare systems. Some have more advanced than others. And that means, of course, that, that if you have young people who are, uh, who are uh, not doing uh, the, the, the savings and the insurance and, 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 and all that you would need to do as, as the, the, the good old self-employed, uh, if, if we go back in the models, uh, that, that means that there might be people, uh, a lot of people needing to turn to the basic safety net uh, while, of course, uh, the, they, they have not contributed as such, because in many countries, self-employment has an extremely low tax rate for European standards. So I think that shows that there is, a, a, I mean, we know that when finance ministries get interested, uh, it, things start moving <laughs> uh, more, even more than if other min ministries uh, uh, are interested. So I think we see uh, an interesting push on us at European level also to take this on and, and, and to support. And then we also have the issue in the EU that, that 
measures. One, uh, of course, we want to be competitive and, 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 uh, and, and there are a lot of positive things with the platform economy, but having 25 different systems will be, make it very, very difficult to run a, a, you know, a well-functioning platform serving clients. So that's a challenge, but we also have uh, a, a tremendous amount of borders uh, and, and cross-border workers. And here, uh, I mean, it might not be that relevant, but, but I'm sure that I don't know how many thousand uh, Uber drivers are actually driving across borders today in the EU, uh, national borders. I mean, you might have that on, on the state level, but for us, of course, you could have two absolutely complete different systems. Uh, and, and then you, you drive into the Netherlands in, in a city like Maastricht, who basically is, is you know, three, three countries, and you'd, you'd, you'd be self-employed for 25 meters, and then you'd be a worker, and then you'd be self-employed again for a while. Uh, so, so I think there are some issues there that, that are making this very important to address uh, in, a, in a rather uniform way. Um, so, so that would be a driver uh that and but for us i think the the platform would be at least that's how our, our political leaders see it for the moment that the platforms would be the first step to maybe address precariousness and this issue in a broader context in a second step but it's so dominant for the platforms right now and also with the pandemic we've all witnessed the risks of, of that the many of these local platform uh workers are, are uh, um, living through. So, so I think that's just an addition to Maria's point. Yeah, and very interesting. I, I, as you were talking, it occurred to me that the events of the last year with the pandemic and the economic consequences, certainly I would assume have really exacerbated these problems and highlighted these problems. Um, so Jessica, let's turn to you in terms of the platform economy and how it fits into this whole debate. Sure. Well, I think as we sort of talked about before, you know, we we don't we don't look at the technology that's being used, right? We look at the business model. We look at the relationship between the individual worker and the person who's providing them with the work, right? And trying to make that do that analysis. And and I think the way we think about this is, you know, yes, there's new technology, but really that fundamental relationship never changes. Uh, whether they whether you're using an app to be an employer or whether you're using a phone to be an employer or whether you're using an email. Um, the, the actual relationship doesn't change uh, based on you know the analysis that we use which the totality of the circumstances so we don't necessarily um, focus on the platform economy separate from the economy as the whole um, it is another space it is another uh, business model in the industries where they are whether it's and to maria's point whether it's transportation whether it's um, domestic work to, whether it's uh, construction work um, i i tell this story often but i um, we just actually in uh, issued a in circuit court um, we found dishwashers in a restaurant who were being classified as independent contractors um, and again, that's a business model. That doesn't matter whether they were dispatched from an app or told to show up tomorrow. Um, that, that's a business model and that's what we're focused on. We just uh, recovered $1.6 million for 550 home healthcare workers who were misclassified as independent contractors. Um, and again, it doesn't matter how they were sent to that workplace. Uh, they were performing that work and we need to look at that relationship between the employer and the worker uh, and to make sure that they have the protections. Those workers uh, were not getting overtime, right? And they were working to take care of some of our most vulnerable uh, older adults. And so I, I think that what, what we think about in terms of, of the, the platform is, is that we, the, the benefit of us is that we can also use this new technology to help protect more workers. They aren't mutually exclusive. They aren't, they aren't attention, a dichotomy attention that in order to have a successful platform business, you by definition have to misclassify workers as independent contractors. It also doesn't mean to Maria's point that every app based platform based work um, is, uh, is an employment relationship. We have to do that analysis on a case-by-case -case basis based on the individual relationship with the worker and, and the employer. And that's what we're doing. Um, so I know that's not as exciting or as interesting, uh, but it is sort of fundamentally boots on the ground, how we get the work done in the wage and hour division is that uh, we go where the workers need us. And again, we're focused on the most vulnerable workers. Um, we, we, talk to, we do talk to drivers uh, in our transportation sector and you know they tell us the stories of them they're working 
to keep working. Uh, and they are, um, they, they don't have the worker place protections that they want. And those, those are vulnerable, exploited workers that we need to help too. So uh, making sure that we are, are, again, taking a look at the actual individual relationship, regardless of how the work is assigned, uh, is the way that we're going to continue to look at uh, enforcing the minimum wage and overtime laws that are under our purview. Yeah, uh, Jessica, what you bring to mind, of course, is that taxi drivers in the U.S., for the most part over the last few decades, have been treated by the courts as independent contractors. Um, a lot of cases came to the National Labor Relations Board and the courts didn't always like the employee findings. So um, in, in the little bit of time remaining, let me just quickly return to something that Stefan has already um, mentioned to us, which is the European Commission currently has under consideration whether to issue a directive or guidance that would redefine the scope of EU competition law to enable collective bargaining under some circumstances for the solo self-employed. Um, we have nothing comparable afoot in the US at the federal level, although there have been some experiments at the state and local level to allow the self-employed to bargain collectively free of antitrust law constraints. So I wonder if uh, quickly, just what's the status of the initiative in the European Union? I think you've already mentioned this, Stefan, but just to highlight it, Maria, if you'd like to comment on it, and then uh, I'll, I'll turn to Jessica, just in case you have anything you want to weigh in on, on this topic of collective bargaining for the self-employed. So, Stefan? Thanks again, William. Yes, uh, yeah, I got a bit uh, ahead of me there. Uh, the the uh, no, the, the, so th this is uh, this is not an active proposal as such, but it would be clarifying or or showing uh, clearly that uh, this this uh, cartel provision, uh, which which prohibits um, agreements uh, of, on prices between uh, between uh, undertakings, uh, just to. You know, I have nothing against dentists, but but just to take the dentist again, uh, uh, we we have, uh, for example, we've had in some countries, uh, you know, price deals between between the dentists, and 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 those were then uh, uh, deemed illegal under competition law because uh, it was price fixing as a cartel, and and uh, and here, uh, of course, the the situation of the vulnerable self-employed uh, rather than the bogus self-employed because uh, then if it's bogus it's a worker and it would be fine but but the the possibly and and here the the our, our great very competent competition lawyers are, are looking in in a way of formulating this so that the vulnerable one person uh, self-employed could uh, could uh, uh, take part in a collective uh, deal with uh, the platform, a collective agreement or or other agreement. So 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 that's uh, that and and uh, that is not going through this consultation process that I mentioned because it's another legal basis, but uh, that's being consulted uh, publicly and uh, and the aim is that we go through with these two proposals together, um, and of course they 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 do interact with each other because. If we would have a presumption of worker, uh, there would be a that would be very strong and and, and compassing. That would of course uh, make this uh, proposal still important, but not as uh, quantitatively important. While if we would go a bit more narrow, th this would be so. So they will work very important, very much together. And we do see developments now across the EU. Uh, 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 that that there are increasing uh, agreements, and uh, and uh, so so and so far, I'm not aware that national uh, competition authorities have said no to these. Um, but it is a bit of a gray zone that needs to be that needs to be clarified. So so that is what's going on for the moment. But it would it would. We're we're looking more at a guideline rather than doing a, a real legal change. I nice. see. Thank you. Thank you for that explanation. And by the way, about in the 1990s, doctors in the United States who were self-employed 
uh, tried to get legislation that would free them from antitrust law constraints so they could better negotiate with the insurance companies. Uh, they got a bill through the House of Representatives and then it just died. So uh, Maria, anything you want to add to this uh, to this topic? No, maybe just going back to uh, what the, what Jessica was saying. You know that there, there, there's no specific um, uh, no initiative with regards to platform workers. So the technologies doesn't matter. It's the business model. So it's about all workers. And I think that the the, the initiative uh, on the competition law. Uh, and collective agreements where it is for all self-employed, vulnerable self-employed, because you don't only find vulnerable self-employed within the platform economy, you find it across the economy. And so I think that, that you know, that's a very important in initiative to that sense. But also, I think, you know, what, what Stefan said, there were, has been a case in Denmark where there was a collective agreement um, for domestic workers uh, on, on a platform for domestic workers. Now, the thing was that a part of the workers were self-employed and a part of the workers were employed, okay? They were employees. And they made this collective agreement first for the employees and then they kind of expanded it also to include the self-employed. And the Danish Competition and Consumer Authority came back and said, can't do that. So they had to kind of roll back on that one with regards to the self-employed. Um, and so it's been a learning lesson. I think, you know, I think also that's it, you know, it's, it's a new way of, 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 of operating. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's about testing how one can go forward and, and, and ensure that finance ministers, I'm glad what Stefan said about finance ministers being worried. Uh, and I said, that's a very good sign, you know, they get worried, you know, the social minister have been worried for a while. So maybe we can, we can, you know, put, put in place different mechanisms that can ensure that uh, the workers, self-employed in, in a kind of precarious part of, of, of the market, uh, get some, some more rights um, and some more protection. And the state gets some more monies, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I thought Stefan's point about finance ministers was very important as well. Need to light a fire to all the finance ministers. Um, so Jessica, anything you wanna weigh in on? I guess I could just say that the city of Seattle attempted to enact a collective bargaining law for Uber type drivers. And it was struck down by the court as not meeting the so-called state action exemption from the antitrust laws. Um, but that was uh, just the beginning of the discussion, which is ongoing. But Jessica, anything you want to weigh in on in this topic? I think I would just say that, you know, the, the president has certainly expressed his commitment to collective bargaining and ensuring that workers have a voice at work and are able to join together. And, uh, you know, Secretary Walsh from the Department of Labor um, is very active in the president's task force in order to make sure we're um, expanding and making opportunities to collectively bargain and join unions uh, available to as many workers as possible. And I think that also is aligned with um, the administration's real focus on equity. And fundamentally, I think we are thinking about misclassification as an equity issue as well. I think I'm, we're hearing that from, from Stefan and, and Maria, is that you know this is a social justice, an economic justice, a gender justice uh, issue that we need to look at. We are seeing uh, the vulnerable workers in immigrate, immigrants, women, um, and people of color um, are really, uh, challenged by this misclassification of workers. And um, that's that's where really our focus is, the administration's focus is, is making sure that we're protecting um, all of those workers with a lens toward voice at work, as well as um, equity and, and addressing disparities. So I think all of those things aligned really are, are, are part of this larger conversation. mute myself. Thank you all for just a, a really fascinating substantive discussion. I wish we could go on. Uh, there are a few questions that came into the chat, which I'd love to post to you. Just to mention, someone said, as a person who was self-employed by choice, what can you do to assure me that the ABC test will not affect me negatively? Uh, and then another question, probably particularly of interest to you, Jessica, about the construction industry, which has been moving from misclassifying employees to cash payments. Uh, and the person wanted to know, has this switch to cash occurred in the European Union? I'm afraid we don't have time to go around and, and ask each of you to weigh in on those two questions. Um, but I re really think this has been a, a terrific discussion. I thank the three speakers. I thank our audience. Uh, and I want to remind the audience uh, that 
To find out about future webinars like this, please sign up for the Economic Policies newsletter at epi.org slash sign up. Uh, also check out EPI's latest news and analysis at epi.org and follow us on social media. Um, my thanks again, my uh, heartfelt thanks to the EPI and the FES for sponsoring this program, to our three wonderful speakers. It was my pleasure uh, to moderate this discussion, to get to listen to you and to get to learn from you. Uh, hopefully there'll be future opportunities. So with that, I, I, I wish you all well. Have a good afternoon and what remains of it for you in Europe.